Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Easy Conversations, a podcast about having easy conversations. I'm your host, Furkan Dandia. In this week's episode, I sit down with Big Al Casey from Lads, Dads, and a Couple Beers podcast. Al shares his story of struggling with mental health from childhood and then becoming a semi-professional boxer. Al also talks about the fight that he went into had he won, he would have become a professional boxer, but unfortunately, that fight only lasted 15 seconds because Al suffered a seizure um, from pre-existing back problems. Al talks about the mental health implications from that fight of getting so close and missing out, and then he also talks about suffering from vision problems now from fighting early in his life. Al also shares the work he's doing in the mental health space. I really hope you can get a lot out of this episode, and if at the end you can leave a five-star review, I truly appreciate it. All right, Alex, thanks for joining the podcast today. I appreciate you taking the time, and super grateful for you to come on here and share your story. Um, Before we get started, I want to give you an opportunity to quickly introduce yourself, where, where you are and some of the work you're doing as well and, and how we connected obviously was over Instagram uh, mm-hmm. through our accounts. So yeah, just wanted to hand it over to you and then we'll get into our conversation today. So my name is uh, Alexander Casey, I'm 34. I'm from uh, London, England. Um, I am an ex semi-professional boxer. Um, I'm currently working um, as a social media content creator. Um, I'm part of a a, a team of internet pranksters called uh, Woody and Kleine. They're, they're quite well known across the internet. They have, I think, close to 10 million followers now across all platforms. So uh, get quite a fair bit of exposure from them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have my own podcast called Lads, Dads and a Couple of Beers. Um, I mean, the expression lads and dads is quite uh, quite quite big in the UK. It's quite, it's quite a UK-ism, if you want to call it that. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been working social media for a couple of years now. Um, and... I guess a lot of people always say, oh, what's your claim to fame? Uh, We had a a video we did um, as part of the the social media team, which was a a tattoo video uh, in which uh, I received a really nice mental health tattoo. And it's kind of boosted my mental health advocate career, if you want to call it that. Awesome. And what inspired you to kind of go into the whole mental health field and around the work you're doing, other than obviously the tattoo, but uh, what are the other things that have inspired you? So I, I always kind of, I always suffer from mental health when I was younger, but I, I never kind of really knew how to deal with it. Um, I used to have a lot of situations when I was younger, especially in social situations where I just, I just felt different. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, it's probably different around the world. I mean, there's such a stigma attached to it anyway, but from where I'm from and my family, it's, it's kind of like a London hardened sort of, you just, you just get on with things. You don't, you don't look at, you don't look at your problems too too much. You don't dwell on stuff. You just stiff up a lip and get on with stuff. And I kind of have always always had that mentality in the back of my mind, but it was never my mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just had problems as like growing up, just just trying to deal with with how I was feeling and, and not being able to put put anything to it. Um, never knew what anxiety was. Never knew what depression was. Um, and then I. I started working with with Woody and Kleine and and the other people within the team team WAC as we're commonly known. Mm-hmm. And a few of them just picked up on on the way I was in in certain situations, and um, I was feeling quite down at one particular point. And one of the guys from the team said, "You know what's going on?" And I, I lent on him, and and he we spoke about mental health a lot. Um, and it kind of helped me open up and talk and realize and understand these things. And, and from that, I went and saw some specialists and um, therapists and got some counseling and just realized that I wasn't, it, it wasn't just something that I suffered with. It was something that other people suffer with and mm-hmm. was able to speak about it candidly and openly and, and just and feel that release as well, talking about it. Um, and then we, we did a film in one day where we had to give each other a tattoo uh, as part of a, a comedy skit that we did for the channel. But we we weren't to know what each other's tattoo was. And we were going to be blindfolded, mm-hmm. which is, you know, thinking about it is the stupidest thing. <laughs> <to> think. 
<laughs> thing to do. But um, I mean, that's what we do. It's content. It's funny. That's that's kind of what we're like. So we agreed to it. Of course we did. Um, and I gave him a a tattoo based around his 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 love of football, so soccer. Mm-hmm. Um, his team in in England in London's called West Ham United, and their main rival is Millwall. Mm-hmm. So to put it into context, it's kind of like um, Yankees and the Red Sox. Mm-hmm. You know, it's quite a huge rivalry, and I. And for some reason, Ollie's got a mad phobia of mushrooms. It's a yeah. great, it's a great, it's crazy, but he, he has this phobia of mushrooms. So I got tattooed on his thigh, the top of his thigh, a plate of mushrooms and the Millwall FC logo. So every time he goes to the toilet, he can see he sees this, <laughs> he sees this tattoo. And he got me, I'm thinking, no, oh, he's gonna go for me. He's really gonna stitch me up. And he got me a well, he did he did this, this tattoo, which was a head with all this stuff coming out of it. And, and the quote around it said, don't suffer in silence. The, the pack is stronger together. And it just it just took a turn, the video. And, and from that, I kind of had my, my hand forced to talk about mental health. Mm-hmm. And it kind of, this was a couple of years ago now, but it kind of launched me into this, this voice I never had, knew I had to talk about mental health and speak about the, my experiences and what I went through as a child and my, what I went through in my adult life and the stigmas attached to it. And it's just, it's just, it's just come from strength to strength mm-hmm. and here i am talking to you so yeah, yeah. That, that, that's it really yeah so no, that's... E- elongated intro- introduction but once you get me talking i can't shut up <laughs> <laughs> no that's fine that's uh why we're here it's uh for you to share um and yeah i think part of it is talking through it also gives you that freedom and it liberates you in the sense that you know mm. not only are you sharing your story um it's almost yeah, like I said, it, it's liberating, but you're also helping others who are suffering in silence, like you did at one point, right? Yeah, and, definitely. Um, so I guess before we jump into like the boxing side of things, like, do you mind sharing some of the, just for the listeners, like some of the struggles you may have had at early on in your life, like you mentioned, um, as a child or as you were getting into adulthood, whether it was around anxiety or depression and, you know, what, what were some of the coping mechanisms you were using? Obviously they may not have been appropriate at the time, but mm. obviously, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. So mm. just looking back, what were some of those challenges and what were some of the things you were doing to cope? I think for, for me personally, it was, I mean, look, let, let's be completely honest. Depression and, and anxiety is not something that was really spoken about even 10, 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, it's only it's only in the last, I would say, f- five years that it's become more mainstream and, and socially acceptable to say you suffer from anxiety and depression. And like I said in, in the introduction, I was kind of from a, from a family, and this is nothing against my family. I, I know mm-hmm. they listen to a lot of the interviews that I do, but... Um, it's, it's just the truth of the matter that we're from a hardened sort of stiff upper lip London family. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of it's kind of hard to, to describe the kind of energy around families from London. It's, it's a different kind of vibe. It's you know it's 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 the working class struggles that you just get on with things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I found that extra hard, and I, I, I like I said, I always knew I was different. And look, I'm. I'm one of the guys I like going out and doing stuff with the lads and and having fun with the boys and you know boys 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 and that kind of society now that you know guys are like that but I just I I never could go beyond a certain point with it I would never engage in the in the alpha off if that makes sense Mm -hmm. so you know you see a bunch of guys on a night out and they're all having a great time who can be the loudest in the room and and I just could never engage in that and I always thought why is that and I just thought well that's just not me. It's just not what I'm like. Mm-hmm. And then it got to a point where it'd be like, like in the boxing gym, there was a lot of ego and a lot of, a lot of alphas. And I just found myself, it's a bit of an oxymoron really, because it's not fear. It's not nervousness because mm-hmm. I'm not a fearful person. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've accomplished stuff in life, which people, people wouldn't have based on conquering fears, but it was just, and it's just, it's anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I remember speaking to a friend of mine and he was like, mate, you've, you've got anxiety. You, it's based from something. It's from, it triggers from something. And I kind of, he, he, he said it, the analogy that he gave was perfect. It was imagine being rushing to work. Every single person in the world is attached to their cell phones. 
the mobile phones. It's 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 their it's their left, their right hand. It's you know it's their third hand. Mm-hmm. And you you're on the train and you put it on the seat and you look up and you oh it's your stop. So you run off the train and then you get off the train and you look and you're like where's my phone and you can see it on the seat and the train's going. That initial burst mm-hmm. is how I would feel about walking into a gym, mm-hmm. walking into class. Um, walking to the supermarket, getting out of my car at, at the grocery store, mm-hmm. just that walking out my front door. Oh, but if the, you know, the, the neighbors are looking out the window at me. Mm-hmm. And it was this anxiety that I couldn't quite grasp and understand. Uh, and when I spoke to a therapist and, 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 um, and her counseling, it stemmed from this fear of abandonment that I had from when my father left when I was young, mm-hmm. that I, I kind of feel like I have to, I overthink every social situation because I'm worried that the person is going to, one, not like me, two, I won't be enough, three, they'll abandon me. And it sounds quite drastic to the average person who doesn't suffer from mental health issues, but to other people, and I know that people will resonate with it for people, mm-hmm. for your listeners, that it's, it's, it's these things that, that mold you. And I've learned not to not to let it be a negative. But mm-hmm. that's that's just my makeup. That's just how I am. That's my mm-hmm. that's who that's the, the hand that God's given me, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um and it's how to it's how to use it, it's how to notice when I'm gonna have a bad day, when I'm okay, when I'm not okay, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, it's important to highlight that the fear of abandonment is very common. Um and obviously it stems from childhood. And we Mm -hmm. all kind of have it in different ways. And for me, I have it as well. But the positive, like you said, with it is you can obviously focus on the negative aspects of it. Um, It does create anxiety. But at the same time, it makes you more compassionate. It makes Mm -hmm. you more aware of other people's emotions. You're you're way more sensitive to that kind of stuff. You have more empathy. So there is that positive aspect of it that, you know, we can focus on as well by having those fears you know it's not all doom and yeah, gloom definitely. so I, f- I find as well like from so, sorry to cut you off but i no. I, f- I find from myself as well is that look i look a certain way you know uh, I, I meet people quite often who i speak to on the phone and they look at me and go oh i'd never have thought you looked <laughs> like that because look, i'm covered in tattoos i've yeah. got tattoos all over my neck i've got them i've got them everywhere i look you know let's, let's be honest i look like i've just got out of prison a lot of people say it to me all the time but yeah, I'm not. I'm just a normal guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I choose to express myself in certain ways. Um, and I like talking to people, like you say, you're turning the negatives into a positive where they see that if, look, if someone can look at me and think, right, that's a stereotypical alpha male, which I get a lot. A lot of people do. A lot of people avoid me mm-hmm. because they think I'm a certain way because of the way I look. Mm-hmm. And they see that it can bring someone like me to its knees and that's not an exaggeration i mean to my knees like i've walked in the, i've walked in the front of my house before and it's just crippled me like it's it's like someone's got a, a block of cement and they've just put it on the top of my head mm-hmm. and it's pushing me down and down and down and i use analogies like that all the time with people and they're just they're just shocked but that's a good thing that i can represent myself in a certain way and and people take that positivity that if, if it can affect them, it can affect me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and obviously, mental health has no barriers. And it, <laughs> there's no it doesn't filter based on the way you look, you know, it no. affects everyone the same. And mm-hmm. it's important to have these conversations. And I guess, the other thing I wanted to highlight in what you mentioned was, and I recently did another podcast where that fear of not being accepted, or mm-hmm. feeling different, is what creates anxiety because any, like you said, any social situation you would go into or to the boxing yeah. gym in your head, you knew you were different than the guys mm-hmm. and potentially that fear of just not being accepted or being different was probably what created those anxious feelings of walking into those situations. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, to use another analogy, it's like being that guy who's waiting his turn to say his joke. Mm-hmm. And you say it and just no one laughs. Like yeah. it goes down like a lead balloon. Like no one laughs at all. Yeah. And it's like, oh 
crap everyone's laughing at me you know it's just it's that you, you yeah. fear you fear those situations all the time i kind of i went through a stage where i, I masked it with alcohol like i, I would i would drink not to excessive amounts mm -hmm. my, my father's an alcoholic he so i've kind of always been aware of that that p potential genetic side could creep in so i've always been quite cautious of, of drinking i like mm -hmm. a drink but i don't i don't drink to excess but I, there was a time when i would i would do it to gain that confidence and that's when people would say, oh, they'd never known. They'd never known. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But internally, you were masking those feelings through mm -hmm. alcohol, right? So Hugely. Yeah. Yeah. So so I guess uh, then going into your boxing career and, you know, maybe like explain a little bit because you said you were semi-professional. What was mm -hmm. that like? And then the other thing I want to touch on is, you know, something we kind of touched on briefly before the podcast is some of the the uh physical issues that come after right whether it's uh blows to the head and all of that so sure. yeah if you want to get into that a little bit so i i boxed when i was younger um mm -hmm. i was part of an amateur boxing club here in, Lon in london where i live um i kind of never really had a problem standing up for myself um i kind of I'd, I wouldn't say I was hot headed or I would lose my temper quickly, but I just knew that I'm not, I'm not, you know, it's fight or fright, isn't it? You know, you either back yeah. down or you get, you get stuck in, so to put it. And I just was never someone to, to back down. Um, mm -hmm. So I channeled, channeled my, my emotions and anger from when I was a kid of, of my father leaving through the boxing club. And I loved it. And as you naturally get older through life, you know, becoming a teenager, you, you know, you find friends you find girls <laughs> you know yeah. you find all the things that you do when you're a teenager um and then around my early 20s I, I i i'd kind of gained quite a lot of weight and i thought you know what i'm going to get back into boxing um so i went along to my local gym and there was a there was a guy there who i noticed who was always wearing this this tracksuit that had a boxing promotion company on on his on his tracksuit his logos of all boxing promotions um and I, I started a conversation with him. So said, like, I used to box. Can I, can I come down to, to the gym? He said, yeah, come down. And I went down and he, he, he gave me like a trial, which I found quite strange, but I, you know, I, I passed. I was fine. I was allowed in the club. Yeah. Um, and then he set me up with a, with, a, with a fight pretty quickly. In six weeks, I was training for this fight. And I I wasn't right mentally at the time. I remember not feeling right. And I didn't take it seriously. I, I was going into fight as a heavyweight and I was just really out of shape mm -hmm. um I, I lost in the second round uh but the referee waved it off i was just taking an absolute hiding um and i just remember that humiliation and i thought why have i put myself through this you know there's there is this was in a this was in a hotel but there was a good thousand people there mm -hmm. at this hotel and I could hear, I could hear my family screaming as well. And I just thought, why well, have I done this? And I, look, I come out of the ring and I looked to myself in the mirror and I just, I remember seeing all the cuts and bruises and I thought, I've got to do it again. I've got to prove to myself, I've, got, I've got, still got it in me. So I had my next fight, um, which was lined up with a guy that he pulled out. And so they had to get a last minute step in. And the guy that stepped in was a guy I was familiar with from the area where I live has been quite a notorious, quite a notorious, how do I put it? I wouldn't say villain, that's the wrong word, because I don't think he's ever been a prosecutor for anything. But he was just that guy, you know? Everyone yeah. knows that guy. Yeah. He and he was that guy. And I thought, oh, my God, like, there's no way in hell I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win. And I beat him. I, I beat him within three rounds. Uh, and this was still in sort of like an amateur sort of setting. Mm -hmm. And then the promotion come to me and he said, look, we're going to step you up now. We're going to go into a leagues. Um, let's see what we can do. Bigger venue. Next fight got announced. Um, I won that. Uh, 2,000 people. We were back into really good shape. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to give this a go. Like, I'm going to try mm -hmm. and turn professional. I set all my ambitions on turning professional. Um, my best friend is a, is a MMA fighter. Um, he was he's done quite well on, on the British circuit. Mm -hmm. Um came very, very, very close to UFC, but injury sort of halt with that. And I got told before I was fighting in this particular fight, like, you win this and you'll get a title fight. 
uh, a semi-professional title fight, which then puts you puts you out there for people to see. Mm-hmm. I trained my ass off for that, and I, I won the fight, um, and I was just really good. And then, and then I started getting the, the people calling me out from different areas and different parts of the country. And this one guy, he was just on my case all the time. Oh, well, you know, the, the, the stuff on the stuff online. We we're having a lot of back and forth on Twitter. Uh, a lot of stuff spoken through social media, like just just trash talk. You know, it's part of the game. It's yeah, it's, yeah. it's just what it is. Um, it's one thing I've always been really good at. I'm quite quick, quite witty. Yeah. Um, my friend would. I had a friend of mine who, who chipped in every now and again and said, "You'll never win." Like, you know, yes, you might beat him in the ring, but you'll never win trying to like catch him on a joke. I love. I was just, yeah. Every time he had, I had something back for him. And yeah, I noticed he had quite a following. The fight got announced and it was the first fight where they were doing a press conference. So I had that all lined up and I, and I, the ang- I, I thought I'd shake, shake it, sorry, I thought I'd shaken off all the anxiety and depression. I thought I got rid of it and I'd cut weight for this fight and I hadn't cut weight well. And we got to the day of the weigh-in and I was, I was really, really, really scared. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, why am, I'm not this guy. I'm not this guy. And for the first time in my life, I had fright. I didn't have fight, I had fright. And I didn't know what to do. And I tried to hide it from everyone. So it came to the the, the, the weigh-in and we did the weigh-in and we had the face-off. Um, I, I was the, the reigning champion, so I had the belt. And he got in my face and he's, he's staring me down. And I took my top off because he had his top on still. So I took my top off. And it, looking back, it's probably the worst thing I could have done because I hadn't cut weight that greatly. So I, I, didn't, I didn't look in the best of shape mm-hmm. don't get me wrong i was fit yeah you know i've always said you haven't got to be in the best shape of your life to, to, to be an athlete look at andy ruiz jr who beat anthony joshua you know, mm-hmm. two years ago and you know he's probably one of the fastest heavyweights in all the boxing <laughs> yeah and he was you know and he was that one you know undisputed heavyweight champion as well so i wasn't overly that bothered about i was never body conscious but we had a bit of back and forth and i, I said something in his ear i won't repeat what i said um and then I went online. This is the night before the fight as well. So I went online and I, the comments were just, I mean, I was getting absolutely slated from all angles. Like, oh, look at this guy. Who does he think he is? Look at all them prison tattoos. Look at those Nazi tattoos. I haven't got any Nazi tattoos. I'm not a neo-Nazi. Yeah. yeah. But look at these Nazi tattoos. Look at this guy. Oh, nice boobs. And oh, look at fat man taking his top off. And oh, G- go on, Jimmy, smash him and all this. And I was just like, my God, I, I shouldn't have read these. And I never used to be that bothered about it. But that's when, from that particular moment, and since then, obviously working social media and having a, quite a large following myself, I've never been able to deal with trolls. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not thick-skinned. I've learned I'm quite thin-skinned, mm-hmm. which is something now, look, I'm going to openly admit to people, I'm, I am thin-skinned. I don't take a joke too well. I can't help it. That's the way I am. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm reading all these comments and it got in my head. So the day of fire, I'm like, I've got to do it. I've got to do this. I've got to do it. And I just didn't feel right. My head weren't there. Waiting. You know, we keep crossing over each other backstage. And at one point he looked at me and I thought, oh, do you know what? I'm going to go and talk to him. So I went over to talk to him and my coach got in the way. I said, where are you going? I said, I need to just go and have a chat with him. He said, are you crazy? Like, no. Why would you do that? I said, and I wanted to go and talk to him. And in a sense, kind of like, I don't know. I don't know what I would have said, but if mm-hmm. I'm being completely honest, I think I would have said to him, look, I'm not feeling this. You're going to win. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, whatever would possess me to do that is the stupidest thing you could do as a boxer before, you know, go over to your opponent and go, look, I'm really scared you're going to beat me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we went to do the walkout and they played my, the wrong song, my walkout music. So I'm like, oh, great. That's in my head now. <laughs> That's another so thing, I'm like, right, okay, so it's a long walk to the ring. And as I'm walking, I had to walk past his his supporters. And this is quite a large venue, by the way. This is like, it was probably close to 3,000 people there. Mm-hmm. And his his people were getting in my face, pointing at me. And I had the home crown advantage. And you'd never have known. I couldn't even hear him because all I could see where he's following. And he's shouting, and he's screaming, just hurling abuse. And I'm like, caught they're in my head. And I got in the ring and I just looked him in his eyes and I thought, I'm going to die or 
you're going to die. And I didn't want, you know, I didn't think of it like, oh, we want death in a ring, but mm -hmm. I just thought I have to get through this fight. He come out of the corner. I, I caught him straight away, swung a left. I went left uppercut. I rolled under one of his punches and I felt something go. I was like, oh no. And my back went into a spasm and I, I, uh, I had two slip discs. Oh. within 14 seconds of the first round and I just hit the deck and I started having a seizure and I, all I could hear was just people, my family screaming the paramedics come running in and to be fair to Jimmy, he was on his knees next to me holding my hand saying come on come on, play. You, you, it's okay, it's okay like forget the fight, you, you're okay and I couldn't talk, I was, I was in a spasm and my sister was in a hysterics, so they're trying to calm her down my wife was screaming they got me out of the ring um, and because it took so long, we, we was the co-main event. So it was the main event after my fight. I had to cancel the rest of the evening. I went to the hospital, was in for a couple of days and then released me. And I had a long rehabilitation to get back to, just to getting out of bed. Mm -hmm. And that was probably one of the darkest times of my life because I had so many things happen. I, I'd let all my fans down. I'd let I'd let my family down. I'd let all the people down there. I'd let all the other people that were there to support the main event down. I'd cost people thousands and pounds of money. My sponsors were obviously, you know, mm -hmm. they were like, what can we do? Um, and then I'm getting hate then even more, like people saying, oh, you know, you knew you had an injury. You shouldn't have gone into the fight. And so, do you know what? I, I, I did know I had a little pain there, but I just, you know, I got on with it. Um, which was a stupid thing to do. And that caused me one of the, the, the biggest spirals of depression I've ever had. And I, and yeah, I, 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 since then I've, I've had, I had one fight to try and get myself back into it, uh, like an exhibition fight. Mm -hmm. um, but then I was diagnosed with uh, optimum, optimum nerve damage in my left eye and uh, a pinhole kera, called keratotonus in my right eye, which is bulging of the eyeball. Uh, and which I told I'll be, I'll be probably, I'd have, I'm probably going to have about 10% vision in both eyes by the time I'm 60. So it's, it's played a massive part in my life, but I achieved quite a bit. And, and that particular fight that I was going to have was my key fight. Like if I'd have won that, I'd have been turning professional. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's to put, to, to put it, to put it as longly as I have, it, it was the greatest, greatest times of my life, but it's also been the worst. Yeah, no. And thanks for sharing all that, you know, and it must be hard to look back and think about it. Uh, and I guess part of the depression must have also come from like knowing you were that close mm -hmm. and you didn't even get a fair shot at it. Right. Like, I, I just wanted one. I, I, I never, I never said I wanted to like to all my friends and all my family. I never turned around and said to them, I want to be the world's best boxer. I don't, I don't even care about winning like a, a regional title, like a British title or even a European title. Mm -hmm. And a state, the stages of, of when you turn pro, your, your main objective is to win a, an area title. Then you're going to a national title, uh, England title, UK title, European title, Commonwealth title. Then you start going into the ranks of like intercontinental titles. Then you're going to world titles. So there's a lot, a lot of, lot of titles you have to win before you're you know, given a world title shot. I didn't care about any of that. I just wanted one professional fight so I could look on a Wikipedia page and see my name and it said professional boxer. That's all I wanted. Mm -hmm. Just just something to, if, to make my kids proud. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, hard, it's hard for me to talk about. Um, well, you know, I, I struggle to hold back my emotion when I talk about it because ultimately, like you say, I, I came so close, but I just did, it was there. It was, it was, it was mm -hmm. reaching distance. Mm -hmm. And just the way it happened, you know, 15 seconds into the biggest fight of my life. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, no, and I think, you know, I mean, the work you're doing now and being able to talk about it and, and even like be an advocate for mental health, that's something to be proud of too, right? Like, I'm sure your kids would look up to that. Um, yeah, I appreciate and, saying that. Yeah, no, I think the fact that you're able to speak about it, think about the people you're touching and impacting, right? So, um mm -hmm. I think there's, I mean, that in itself takes a lot of courage um, to come out and, and share your story, right? So, but I this is why we do it. You know, this is this is why you do it. If it helps one person, that's enough. 
I've always said that if, mm-hmm. if, if one person messages me and said you've like you, you've helped me so much uh, and I get I'm sure you do as well I get I get messages quite frequently people saying I resonated so much of what you're saying it's such a great platform thank you so much for sharing just that one is enough you know that, that kind of makes up for all the bad times absolutely yeah I mean you know when I hear from people and they're like yeah your podcast resonated for me it's it's such a good feeling because mm. you know it makes you feel like you are making a difference in this world yeah and yeah. it doesn't matter where your name shows up but the fact that you're making a difference in someone's life is huge yeah definitely i think it's more prevalent as well from from people like myself and you and you and you you know just just two average guys you know just yes normal run-of-the-mill fellas you know i've I think a lot of a lot of people in mainstream celebrities and stuff like that they have a lot to answer for 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 talking about mental health. You know, it's, you know, we have it over here with um, all the stuff that's going on at the moment with mm-hmm. the royal family. You know, mm-hmm. and Piers Morgan. I'm sure you're familiar with Piers yeah. Morgan. Yeah. He 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 walked off his his morning show that he had over here because he was being challenged over something he'd said regarding her mental health where he'd said oh i just don't believe her mm-hmm. i mean how can you go but yet it was only two weeks prior to that he was preaching how we've all got to look out for each other and mental health so important during the lockdown and coronavirus and then when someone comes out and said they suffer from mental health based on things that were said he dismissed it mm-hmm. you know I, and, and i do think it's important for people like myself and you to, to keep to keep being advocates because we're the real people we're the real voices yeah yeah, and that's kind of been my goal with this platform. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure celebrities, obviously, with the, the lives they live, they struggle with mental health. But of course, of I course. think for most people, you know, it's being able to relate to people like yourself and me, where mm-hmm. we're just, like you said, we're average people. We're just like everyone else. And when people listen to this, my goal has been to just normalize these conversations, right? So for a guy like oh, you... Definitely. To come on here and talk about you know your story your hustle coming so close because often we only hear about the guys that make it you don't hear about the guys that don't make it right and sure the pain and suffering that comes with that um is also important because there's other people out there who don't make it either whether it's professional sports or other forms of like endeavors right mm. so yeah it's, it's yeah you know, it could be from any any job Mm-hmm. you know in any work environment you, you, you got you work you might work every night you might work at weekends to get that promotion and they go and give it to somebody else mm-hmm. that, that happens every day mm-hmm. yeah. so yeah yeah it's definitely it's definitely better to hear from people like us i've always i've always thought that yeah for sure and so with your vision now like obviously uh i'm assuming that's a lot of it with the boxing right like the probably the shots you took so um what are you doing right now to deal with that like obviously you've gotten like the the medical uh opinion on it but what are the things you're doing right now uh proactively to to mitigate some of that i i'm currently going through the process at the moment to to find out the best steps my i was only speaking to a guest that we had on our podcast She's, she's she's a friend of mine but she's also in the public eye she's um she's an actress um she's been in quite 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 a good few few films actually Mm -hmm. she's very very talented girl but her mother is uh, blind she was diagnosed with a condition when jess was 18 so her mother yeah i'm not sure how old her mother was at the time but and she went fully blind and she's become an advocate for for blindness and guide dogs for the blinds and i was talking to her about my problems and she said well the advances in technology between now and 30 years you know look at it look positive Mm -hmm. look look into that aspect and I'm currently going through that transition of becoming more positive with it. Like I want to watch my kids grow up. I'm noticing weekly, like the, the, the deterioration in my eyesight. I could still just about drive. Mm-hmm. I'm allowed to drive at the moment, but in, in all honesty, I have, an, I have a, an appointment on Thursday to just sort of assess that. And I know I know what the answer is going to be. So again, it's things like that. It's, it's taking taking another thing off me you know it's, mm-hmm. it's something else i can't do i can't take my son to school you know I, I can't go and pick him up from school you know certain situations you know where i where, where people with able sight will be able to do stuff i'm, I'm going to struggle but i'm looking to be more positive about it, it it's something that 
again it's happened i can't change it you know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm i'm accepting of that now i've had my time i've had my i've dwelled on it i've cried you know i've become very close to to feeling like this was going to take over my life mm -hmm. to the point where i thought what's the point you know if you can't see what's the point of, of being here but there are things to to be grateful for and and i'm i'm just hoping that it, they can slow it down enough for me to just watch my kids get old and you know i'll i'll, I'll, I'll rest easy in my armchair a fat old man <laughs> yeah yeah no i uh alex i again just want to commend you for everything you've shared you know you've kept it real um and what you've highlighted is that you know everyone struggles in their own way and you, mm -hmm. you can either let it consume your life or you can find the positive uh, side of it as well uh, yeah. which you seem to have indicated uh, in your own life and I know it must be tough to think about the future and the uncertainty and some of the things so you know I wish you the best uh, thank you I appreciate you know, that and your, all the work you're doing has been amazing I've been truly inspired by just sitting here and listening to your story um, you know my heart goes out to you and um, you know again like I said I wish everything works out for the best thank you thank you very much Welcome. And I guess for listeners that, you know, want to get a hold of you, uh, maybe reach out to you, you know, um, based on your story or anything, what's the best way to get a hold of you? I know you mentioned you have your own podcast, but through social media and all that stuff. Um, phew, open a window and shout. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I don't know, pigeons. You can put pigeons out. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, they don't travel far now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, uh, yes, I'm, I'm on Instagram, uh, Big Al Casey. Um, we also have a podcast called uh, Lads, Dads and a Couple of Beers. Um, yeah, you type in Big Al Casey to Instagram. I'm, I'm right there. Um, I've got 20, 25,000 followers. So I do I do read all my message requests. I, I'm, not, I'm not someone who ignores messages, even if I just like the message or Mm -hmm. or show some sort of witness i've seen it i'll always respond to a message so you can reach out to me at any point any point at all yeah and i mean like you know we were able to connect on instagram so that was great um and you responded right away so you know if you ever want to reach out to al give him a shout he'll respond so um you know again i want to thank you for coming on here taking the time sharing your story uh, i appreciate you having me on yeah no thanks well, that's the end of the episode. Thank you again for tuning in and uh, showing your support. Until next week.